Hello and welcome to another edition of Trash Arts Tick with me, Ryan, Sam and Jackson. We've got special guest Robbie Hampstead on today as we discuss the Oscars and on today's show that's what we're going to kick off with. We're going to talk about the Oscars, we're going to be reviewing everything that happened and um, our, well, our opinions basically on everything that went on. Later on we're going to be joined by Stephen Sibley who's going to talk us through his career and um, give us a bit of an insight as to his filmmaking and um, kind of where he's at right now and what the future holds. Other than that, without further ado, let's get straight into the Oscars. So guys, the Oscars. Yeah. It did something right for once. It actually gave, well, I mean, it's done it a few times. Moonlight, when Moonlight won, it deserved to win despite the whole chaos of the La La Land uh, envelope problem. <laughs> Which was the most craziest night, because I remember we were watching it with um, a few people, and we got to the point where we were so fed up of hearing that La La Land had won awards. They were like, let's just go to bed, done with this. And I remember going to bed and then getting a text from my friend just being like, Moon <laughs> Moonlight won, Moonlight won. How many awards did they actually win, La La Land, that year? Uh, five. Five. But it was, you know, it was, it was, they love musicals, they love certain types of films. And to see them give it to Parasite for best film, which has never, ever, ever, ever happened yep. in foreign, like in that a film of an international language has won film. They've been nominated a few times, but I think there's only been like 11 nominations over nice two years. So for them to go for a winner for a film, which essentially is about class, and from a director who is a well-respected director, but usually within genre films, like Snowpiercer and Okja. Like, the guy's a brilliant director, and they won so many things. And I remember when we were watching it with Robbie, and when we were watching the the Sky people, we were like, oh, it's going to be 1917, rah, 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 rah. Yeah, <laughs> they wouldn't shut up about it. They were awful. <laughs> yeah, and when he won Best Director, everything changed. Everyone was like, whoa, that was unexpected. Mm -hmm. and, and that's like... It just showed that there was respect towards the film. There was one thing, sorry, that happened slightly off topic. Um, so I read somewhere afterwards, I can't remember who did the coverage, but a reporter actually asked the director of Parasite, what made you want to make a Korean film? <laughs> because he's Korean. Yeah, there's been, a weird, there's been a weird backlash from like internet trolls and YouTube. Well, mostly, let's be honest, white men. I've been getting very angry at the fact that that international come films from a group of Oscar. white men. That's quite like you know. <laughs> we know what we're white talking man. about here. It's so strange that, that that like that there has been this weird backlash of being like, no, the Oscars should be an American film. It's like no, the Oscars is an American award ceremony, but it's supposed to represent cinema, and for a long time it never really does, and now and then it just does something where you go, oh, actually it is representing like what's going on. And Parasite was the perfect film for that. I think Joaquin Phoenix kind of summed that up in as much as whenever he, well, obviously won Best Actor, but um, <clears throat> whenever he did a speech, he spoke about how much he loves films and it shouldn't just be him standing up there because he's like appreciative of the fact of everyone else within the industry doing their thing and everyone else who's nominated with him for Best Actor. Um, so yeah, I kind of get that point. Mm. Very similar. That's the thing, like, and it, it's, I'm not saying award ceremonies should be used for activism, but the fact is, Joaquin Phoenix used every single opportunity to talk about something that was on his mind that wasn't to do with the film. He never, he rarely ever said thank you for, you know, yeah, maybe yeah. being the Joker and stuff. And he also, I know it's not a big thing, and I can't remember where we found it out, but he wore the same suit for yeah. every award ceremony that he went to. It's not a big thing, but when you're seeing, like, the red carpet where they were, what were they, they were talking about? Insta sustainability. They were talking oh, about sustainability yeah, yeah. with clothes, and it was just like. And they kept saying, oh, this is a nod to being eco friendly, and you're like, a nod to being eco friendly? What, what, <laughs> just, what does that mean? <laughs> what is that? You have you know? to buy new clothes every time you go to a new event. <laughs> yeah, so they might as well be recycled clothes. You know? Yeah, like, yeah. Isn't that much better? Yeah, great. Yeah, but some of those costumes. On the awards, are like you know, you look at them and think, did they wear their? Are they wearing their own curtains? <laughs> <laughs> it, 
Yeah, I don't I don't really understand it all, but then I'm not really one to dress up. I'm, you know, scruffy, I know, so yeah. Jackson's our hobo. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just big compo from summer wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was I was disappointed, and I know that it was a long shot, but I I really feel like the lighthouse should have won best cinematography. It was um, never and I, get, win. I know it was never going to win. I know it was never going to win. I wanted it to win. That's not the that's not the point. Nineteen seventeen. You know, it was great that it was like a, a one shot and everything like that. But I've seen that before. I've seen it, and I've seen it done in more interesting ways. So like. Uh, that was what um, Birdman that won the. What did that win? Did that win? Yeah, that won. That won cinematography. Yeah, exactly. So come on, change it up. Like that was like the lighthouse was genuinely. We got cats fighting in the background <laughs> here. Like this is, this is not conducive to me thinking properly. Um, but the thing is, you also haven't seen the other films that were nominated for cinematography in that regards, because all the every single yeah. film that was nominated for cinematography was stunning. Oh Most yeah, yeah, yeah. Time yeah. Hollywood that, was stunning. Yeah, yeah. That's that's, the Irish that's true. You know, like there were so many great yeah, films. I can, oh, uh, yeah, and I, I don't. I, it's Good not. That I think that they weren't. Star- it's that I feel like the Lighthouse did something like very, very different in terms of cinematography and what it, what it, uh, what it did with the camera itself. So I, I just think it deserved. You know, I think it deserved to stand out amongst amongst the crowd. It could have won best sound. You know. Yeah, the sound of it was epic <laughs> as well. Like, well. It did well at the Spirit Awards, though. William yeah. Defoe won best actor there, and that's the thing. Like the Oscars, unfortunately, as we've discussed before, there are certain genres that just do not get the attention, and it's it's horror. <laughs> Sci-fi gets a lot of attention, but horror doesn't. Generally speaking, it's very rare for a film Get Out is last time, but again. People always debate whether a gal is a horror film. So they just they're trying to be more genre towards comic books because the annoying thing as well is the Oscars always have to consider it's on ABC. They need viewers, so they'll try and that's why they're going to do the popular film awards thing. Oh with, yeah, God, that was a silly idea. Yeah, they just kind of went, you know, let's not be stupid. Let's just nominate those films for top ten if we think they're that good. Because obviously Joker was a billion, you know, it was a billion dollars, so more people are going to watch it. That's their weird thinking. Whereas if it's a bunch of indie films, they're not going to get the viewers in. Sometimes Oscars does come down to that. Mm. And it's really unfortunate. But they at least try to, like, they, they pushed it a bit more this year. You know, mm. there, was some, there was a decent range of films from indie to, well, international. And yeah, I think Joker. <coughs> with this year, especially... I think that on year, in years gone by, it kind of became very formatic that, um, oh, okay, whoever won Best Actor, oh, that means that they're probably going to win Best Picture as well. Or whoever won Best Director yeah. is probably going to win Best Picture. Whoever won Best Supporting Actor or Best Supporting Actor is going to win Best... You know, you kind of started stacking up with all these nominations for... Like Ooh. one film in particular, and then they run away with it. Mm. Uh, I suppose it touches on your point earlier with La La Land. Um, whereas this one was like slightly different because Best Actor went to Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, yeah. Um, Best Supporting Actor was Brad Pitt in um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Well deserved. Which I think, I think they won, was it two awards in the end, Robbie? I think it was, yeah. Yeah, because Joker won two awards. It was actually quite spread out. Mm. Except from one film, they didn't give it any nominations and just got lots of Netflix jokes, The Irishman. Yeah. yeah. Not one single win. And it's insane. You would have thought at least it won Best CGI. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but no, that went to 1917. And they just, every, like, they were just constantly hammering home that, that Netflix thing. Like, the, the people on Sky talking about, I don't know what it was like in America, but, like, you know, they just kept saying about, about uh, you know, watching it on a phone or watching a season of it or something like that. Just yeah, making it's just little old. snide it's... remarks. Exactly. I think it's, well, with Irish Story being a Netflix original, Marriage, uh, uh, Irish Story, Irishman, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the Irish one and I'm getting that wrong. Um, <laughs> Yeah, with Irishman, uh, obviously being Netflix, Marriage Story was as well. Um, and it was nominated, but mm. again, it didn't... didn't get the big wins. Yeah, it didn't. No, uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of frustrating. I mean, like, the thing is, the Oscar season itself is a very frustrating game when you know and you just follow the statistics. Once you do the festivals, the ones that get all of the Oscar-worthy talk, 
then they're going to spend all the money to try and push those films. After that, it's all about if they can do well in the box office, and then your top 10 year list from all the journalists across America. Then you go to your, like, your Guild Awards, uh, Golden Globes, BAFTAs, and you just see the same name go, that one's going to win, and that one's going to win. And the Oscars are supposed to be the one that pushes it and goes, ooh, you didn't see that coming. And they did it with Best Film this year in Best Director. Yeah. Mm. But the actors was pretty much, they were the ones chosen Nailed on. immediately. There was no surprises. And it was kind of boring. And although it was great to see Brad Pitt win Best Actor, for what I consider to be his best role, like Joaquin Phoenix has done way better. Laura Dern's done way better. Yeah. Um... Rene Zellweger, you know, that's just the biopic thing. It should have been... Uh, there's a lot... There have been much better female performances last year than just Rene Zellweger. But they always have to have one of those comeback sort of things. And it just... It was a bit of a boring season. Even though the right film won Best Film, it was a really boring season. Well, another Netflix film that was nominated was also The, uh, the Two Popes. Yeah, yeah, two popes. And, um, you love the two popes. I watched it last <laughs> night, and um, I thought oh, I'll give it a go, you know. And uh, I was like, ten minutes. I thought I'll give it ten minutes, and about an hour and a half later, I was still watching. I was like, oh god, this is good. This so I sort of pause it, get some popcorn, you know. <laughs> and, uh, I did. Going all out, invested. Yeah, I was there. Oh god, bloody hell, you know, this is good. This and after it finished, I'm like, why did it win an award? This is absolutely brilliant. It's because. Yeah. Um, Again, it's Netflix. It's a hard one yeah. to... And also, there's, the truth is, 2019 was a great year for film. Yeah. That's, it, it was a really great year. And that's why when they talk about Oscar snubs, which there were loads, there was still a decent amount of great films that got through. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, that's it's, just the, the quality of films last year was actually incredible. Like, yeah, There yeah. were so many great films. Uh, well, we've discussed as well the ones yeah. that were our favourites from 2019 that weren't even nominated. Mm. Yeah. And that just goes to show, like, the ones that were nominated, not saying that they're better than the ones that weren't, but there was such a calibre of... Yeah. The thing is, the Oscars have been in a desperate rush since um, uh, Oscar So White, which I think was in 2016, when The Revenant... Um, the Revenant didn't win, did it? No, it was Spotlight that won, but it was that year. They've been trying to fight with more of a... bringing more inclusivity. It's like, I think it's 20% international and 80% um, the, the usual West kind of people. Um, what is that, the Academy, you mean? Yeah. The, so the Academy's made up of, they, they've brought in... Uh, they tried to diversify more, yeah. Diversify the Academy, okay. Cool. Because it was very obvious that, yeah, this is just old white men making decisions and film is supposed to be much more. And I think, um, I think it's, it has kind of like, you can start to see it. You're starting to see a different kind of the films, well, like this with Parasite winning. That's if you saw the coverage in like South Korea, there were millions of people celebrating. Each political party had to write a statement about the success of Parasite. Really, it's which a is huge quite thing. it's quite extreme as well for every political party mm. to write something about a film about class. I mean, can you imagine trying to get the Conservatives to sign on to like a Ken Loach film. yeah Ken Loach <laughs> film or something like? <laughs> You imagine that pitch. <laughs> so maybe over the next few years we'll see more of it. And even the fact that Pedro Almodovar was nominated for Best Actor for um, Path and... Um, what is it? Pain and Glory? Pain and Glory. Uh, Pedro Almodovar's film. Which he won Best Actor at Cannes. Same as Parasite won Best Film at Cannes. And again, you're seeing that correlation. It's very rare for a Cannes film to actually win Best Film. Because Khan tries to be more towards the art side. Yeah. It's usually like if you win Toronto, you're guaranteed to get an Oscar nomination, which Jojo Rabbit did do. Mm. Um, yeah, like, you're starting to see, though, that perhaps we will start seeing more actors from, you know, international films that have got a decent box office and decent critical reception may actually get more Oscar nominations. We'll see. It's, uh, it's an interesting one to think. Did, did the um, did Parasite... Um get nominated for any acting awards. No, that, that was the one thing. It won the SAG Awards yeah, for Best Yeah, I acting. felt like that would be like a bit of a, I don't know, a barrier because, yeah. of, the, because of the language barrier. I mean, like... Well, again, if we seems... compare it to last year when you had Roma. Hmm. Roma got 11 Oscar nominations, I think. It was either 11 or 10. And that was a black and white Mexican film by Alfonso Cuaron. And again, like, it got acting nominations, Best Supporting Actor and Actress. It was a big deal. 
But then they gave Green Book the award. Yeah. And again, it feels like a Netflix thing. Or perhaps they still weren't diversified yet to go, all right, now's the international film. Because I never thought it'd be like, you'd think it's more likely to be, considering the politics in America, a Mexican film about class, than a year later, a Korean film about class. Yeah. It's, it's weird, but it's great. It's really great. And the, like I said, the director's brilliant. He's been entertaining as hell. Like, all his speeches, he just wanted to get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently his translator, I read today, like, she's... She, she's a filmmaker herself, which they said in the Sky people talking mm. about it. But she's making a film about the whole Oscar season. Oh, is she? Yeah, which would be fascinating to watch, you know? That would be interesting. Yeah. I love how... Sorry, Robbie. I love how whenever he was getting interviewed at one stage... Um, I can't even pronounce it. I'm not even going to attempt that. Boo. Bong. Bong, sorry. Um, whenever he was getting interviewed at one stage, um, obviously she's translating... And then it's like, oh, how are you going to celebrate? And he's like, we're going to party! And that was the only thing he said in English in <laughs> that interview. And I was like, yes. But um, I just found it funny that um, every time he won an award and came up, um, he was getting more and more like, sort of like he was on the verge of like, going to pass out because it was so... And I was saying to Sam, I said, if he wins best film, I swear to God, he's going to pass out straight in the middle of the aisle. Like, you know? <laughs> That's the thing. There was genuine joy. Like he, they, they knew they were. Well, they didn't know, but they were hoping they were going to win Best International Film, which again was the first time South Korea has ever been nominated for Best Best International Film. And then for him to win director, and then he used it as an opportunity to basically thank Martin Scorsese, because um, he, he gave a quote that Martin Scorsese had said, and then said Martin Scorsese said that. Wasn't that a standing then, ovation? Yeah, everyone stood up and started yeah. applauding him and then Martin Scorsese is like, like, almost in tears, like, no, no, no. <laughs> it was just a beautiful moment. And it, it kind of made you feel like he probably doesn't care about not winning anything for the Irishman because that's a really beautiful moment because Scorsese has a deep respect for cinema. That's why he's always restoring cinema. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, there, there were highs and there were lows in the Oscars. I mean, the musical performances, terrible. I was going to touch on that in a second. <laughs> One thing I was going to say initially is... Um, yeah, so whenever the Oscars opened, they had two former hosts come out in Steve Martin and I think Chris Rock. Um, and it became very apparent that the um, Oscar, well, I suppose, whoever runs it, um, the, well, the, what would you call it? Producers? Yeah, well, yeah, they, they kind of knew they'd messed up a little bit in terms of their nominations, that they started cracking jokes about the amount of black people nominated and the amount of women, mm. uh, well, not being in Best Director for Little Women. Um, yeah, I, I think it was just... I think they almost did like a contrast because you had Chris Rock who will say whatever the fuck he wants and yeah. so he should. And Steve Martin who is still like a very funny guy but will bring people back to a more, you know, hey, hey sort of level. We're only joking. <laughs> yeah. But, but the, yeah, the music was terrible. Yeah. Oh, God. Eminem. Yeah. <laughs> what did you say earlier? It was like he was doing a, trying to do a bad impression of himself. It was really... <laughs> it was sad to see, to be honest. Like, Yeah. It like, and it, it like, his new album was all right, but, like, I just don't think he's got the energy anymore. <laughs> like, he's, he's got too old. <laughs> For me, it's kind of like, pick your audience. Yeah, I think that was the wrong audience as well. Yeah, there's a lot of confused faces in the crowd. And yeah. Yeah. And Am I tripping? I mean, and... I don't think he was like, yeah, I'm going to go and do the Oscars. I think someone asked him to do it. Like, it he minute, seemed apparently. confused about doing well, like, it He just himself. appeared on stage like, <laughs> this was in the stage I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> Why is everyone in suits and dresses? <laughs> but still, like, compared to the Frozen number at the beginning with the... Oh, God. What was it, like, 12... Uh, different women from different countries who were all wailing at the same time. Yes. God, that was a bad decision. Yeah. That was terrible. Yeah. And <laughs> it, it's again this instead of like, you know, doing something about diversity, it's this nod to diversity, nod yeah. to environmentally yeah. friendly. Like, we're saying know, stuff just, about it. Exactly. Just just do it or don't. And that's that's <laughs> where that's where like, yeah, there's a lot of fakeness with the Oscars, but when you get the genuine moments of whacking Phoenix's speech and a real winner. It all feels like, you know... You it's know, worth you know, it. The night that was. What a, it's, it's a show. It becomes yeah. a show and you're like, that was a great show. It has highs and lows and that's what it's all about. It's show business after all. 
I think I always give up too quickly with the Oscars. We get into, well, usually about the third or fourth musical performance, and I'm like, right, I'm done. I can't, I can't watch any more of this. I am going. I think other than Eminem, I can't even honestly remember who else performed. I, um, the all... guy from Toy Story, I can't remember his name. Oh, Randy oh yeah, yeah, that was quite sad, because he was just so, like... Yeah, he just he didn't seem very with it as well. He, ah, that set was terrible. It was just clouds. Yeah, yeah. Clouds and, the and the way the he was singing, you could tell he didn't want to be up there. No, it, did, it just felt like he didn't want to be up there. <laughs> so just I, put him on the stage. He just, he just wanted to go home. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so now, moving on, I want to introduce Stephen Sibley. Hello. Right. How you doing? Fine, thanks. How are you? Yeah, really good, thank you. Good. Thank you for joining us today. No, it's brilliant to be here. Nice, thank you very much. You've travelled all the way down from Sunderland to yeah. Portsmouth. <laughs> ten hours, ten hours, but it was worth it. <laughs> definitely worth it. Oh, definitely worth it's it. It's nice having you here. No, I appreciate it. Just to give you guys a bit of a background, um, me and the Trash Arts crew, so, like we met Stephen, Steve, I call you Steve, Yeah. Um, at Horror on Sea, and that was our first kind of interaction. Yeah. And uh, yeah... Other than the fiascos that we had in the evening, I think it's safe to say we kind of bonded around yeah, films. Yeah, yeah, we kept the kick with buddies, you know what I mean? Kept it real. <laughs> it was all no good. fallout, you know what I mean? Got, got keep friendly. You know I mean? Exactly, exactly. So, right, I'm so glad you're here and you're joining us. Yeah. Um, really appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> first thing I want to do is just really want to understand how you got into films and what made you want to become a like a filmmaker? Um, well, what made us want to become filmmakers? Um, various memories of being a kid, of like th between th ages of three and four, was the video nasty era. So when I went to video shops, I see always get covers of all these absurd things, like people getting drills in their heads, people get by cannibals, and these get massive stands for Mad Max Two. And I'd say to my mum, "Why is he mad?" And she said, well, you're too young to know. You can't know until you're 18. It's the 18 rated film. I'd be like, but what, what, what makes Mad Max? What makes him mad? So I was always <laughs> curious. So I was always the kind of curiosity. What happened? Because when you're at school, you get books. You can read the books because the thing. But in your video shop, you've only got the limitation of the images on the back and your imagination runs wild to what could be contained within that video, especially when it's forbidden. Yeah, yeah, When yeah. you're so young. Age limited. So, yeah. So as growing up, even in the town where I lived, I was looking to have five video shops within like a five, watt, five minute walk radius. So I had access to every low budget film, every obscure film, pretty much on VHS. So I had to work my way up to when I got about seven, where they'd allow us to get 18s out. You know what I mean? So I'd say to my mum, yeah, I'm going to get some Donald Duck cartoons. It's different in the north. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I'm going to get some Donald Duck cartoons, yeah, then go down and get some like 18 rated Euro trashers from post apocalyptic stuff, you know what I mean? And then just watch them and she'd watch things like, when I'm like, Things like we were talking about earlier on, like Videodrome. Like, I remember mean, well, I was Videodrome yeah. and she was like, turn around and you are not watching anything like this again. And I'm like, yeah, you see that, but you can't see what I'm <laughs> doing now. So I just keep watching stuff and then obviously I get to a point where I wanted to have my own collection you start buying stuff and then you start like playing with figures on stairs. Mm. So you'd see that like when Fright Night came out, I didn't know it was going to be a sequel, so I'd get me little toys and me Star Wars figures, my He-Man, and make Fright Night Part 2, 3, 4 with these figures. <laughs> yeah, but then what I'd do is right. I'd hold the, the figures close to me eye and do that kind of full polka shot. Like, do all the shots with me eyes and things like that. Or if a figure snapped, I'd be like, oh my god, the film's stuck now. It's like losing an actor, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Jesus, I've got to redo the whole scene now that actor snapped. So, then you, then you get a camera and then you start writing stuff and you start working with actors. But then, when I, because I was at school, so I was always film dominant. That's all I wanted to do. I just didn't stick in that school. Because I thought, shit, what they're going to tell us about film. So, I just do my own thing at home. I wouldn't do my homework. I just sit at home watching five films a night, ten really? films a night. So I was endless stuff and when I was school I had no grades so I couldn't go to college. So all my friends went to college to do their film studies and I'd be like at home. So I got a full time job and I thought right the only thing the best thing to do is buy books. So I bought every book on writing, directing. I, went, I grew out of horror for some reason. I just got sick of seeing violence so I went into all the movies like the 50s, the golden era. Hmm. So I started learning like from like Howard Hawks, Fritz Lang, all these get Robert Wise, all these amazing old directors and learn the craft rather than just seeing people getting killed I want to say the how to build characters and what made these films classics yeah, yeah, yeah. so then I went to like a four year period just watching nothing but classic cinema or anything that wasn't horror that was your education yeah then. that was my education so when these people going to college they'd come I'd see them one night I'd be telling them all these things and we'd go, we haven't learned nothing like this and I'd be like well I've just read it in this book I'm like, <laughs> one night I've learned more than you in six to months to make you feel like you a class I mean? above no no it's not that just they 
it's just the education is the ways to do it. You know what I mean? You either go two routes, you're self taught, or you go down the education route, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I I didn't mean it because obviously I want to go to college because I want access to co equipment. And like these were going off and doing stuff, and I was still at home just writing stuff or kind of like still paying my figures when I was left school, trying to do them last few movies, finish all them loose tie films that I never finished off. I still got cassette tapes with the soundtracks <laughs> on and everything. We'll need exclusivity on them. Yeah, yeah. Very soon. Yeah. Um, so, what was the first film? that you ever made? Um, the first thing I ever shot was a film called In the War and it was about two guys who just ripped off a gangster, that typical story. It was before like kind of like all that kind of stuff kicked off but we just wanted to do something simple. It never got finished because obviously usually your first things never get finished because everybody's got the buzz and then once the actors start to lose that thing, even if it's friends, if they're into it they'll just kind of just drift off, off do yeah, their own thing. And then they'll do their own thing. So then I went on another film called Third House on the Left because that's where my house is, third house on the left, as opposed to last house on the left. And again, that kind of got semi done, but it was just getting actors in just to get killed, killing my house. And like, my mum would come in, I wouldn't show any of the footage because I'd be like, we'll have like women on the bed, like with the panties down and blood all over. Blood. So <laughs> we, 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 one day we filmed to cover the whole sitting room, everything out the sitting room, everything, fish tanks, TVs, everything covered the whole room, black bags. So we'd do murder sequences when she was away for a couple of days, she never knew for years until she got this tape filmed, developed for a camera. And she's like, that's my house. And I'm like, yeah. And she realised that we just took everything out and just come into my house. She another one sequence. Your mum must hate you. She doesn't get it. That's, that, that's what she just doesn't get it. Like, she just thinks I'm twisted. You know what I mean? Like, why are you so sick? Like, why do you not like nice films? It's like, well, they are nice films in a certain way. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's life lessons. You know exactly, know I mean? exactly. Is, you know I mean? So, my next question um, we recently had Tom Lee Rodder on. Yeah. And to do an interview, obviously just want to understand your association with Tom yeah, and uh, uh, how that came about and your relationship really. Well, Thomas is like, but the, I mean, well, we met each other, we're like kind of like, it was our Lykoff and Masterclass, probably about 2000, well early noughties really. Um, really? I was like kind of like, just doing my first feature film, I'd just done a Bangladeshi feature film, like bang, bang, Bangladeshi community, about the drugs in there, and I was doing my own feature film, that, like off my own back, Home for the Bullets. And this was like my first actual completed film that was mine, not like anybody else producing it, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I went down to London, Masterclass, when I got there, it was like a seat there next to two young lads. Thomas was still at school, he's like 15 in the last year of school really? with his brother. So I just sat down next to them and then started talking to them, seeing all kinds of stuff. And he just started naming all these obscure movies. Like, And I was like, whoa, whoa, you're like, <laughs> you're like me like when I was you. It's like, whoa. So we started talking and then we'll start like, after every lesson, we'll start with his mum. And we'll walk back, we'll talk, and then when we're finished, I'd show him some of your stuff, like me home for the bullets trailer, he showed us some of his trailer, and we're like, what? It's like we're just akin to each other, you know what I mean? We're on the same level of like ideas and everything, and we stayed in touch. So he'd come up mine for a few week, days, for a week, watched loads of films, I'd go down his, and we're just done that, and just kept in touch for like Rotated. the last 15 years. And it's yeah. like, we're in touch with each other every other day, we're phoning each other every, every other day because. We've got that connection. That's definitely the connection that, like, uh, well, uh, me and Sam got. Yeah. Um, whenever we met you guys at Horror on yeah. Sea, we already obviously knew Tom. Yeah. But like meeting yourself yeah. as well, and I, I honestly thought you'd move from Sunderland to Birmingham. Yeah. No, and it was Sam that turned around and told me otherwise. I was like, yeah. "Oh, but them guys, they, they're like yeah, so it's close." Like, it's like we've well, just, well, just got that connection, and that's what you want to find. You want to find people on that like same kind of path or that same kind of thing that understand where you're going. And obviously Thomas's films are different from my films, but we still have an understanding and a kind of uh, make sure we're both progress, you know what I mean? We're we'll understanding, we're both honest with each other every time. Mm. We're not gonna blow each other's trump and say, Oh yeah, that was brilliant. And that's what you want. Yeah. We've got that trust level. Yeah, we might jive each other and do little tricks to each other now and again, but we've got that bully love. And I'd say like, it, it's just it's just crazy. If you didn't have that, it would yeah, be yeah. relationship. And it's yeah. like his whole crew, like Dale, James, Gregus, Kevin, like some of my early met in that one day, like James and that, and it was just like, again, that love, that kind yeah, of synergy. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, I met Dale, because I met Dale when I went down there, and he came up mine for a few years, so we're, we're kind of thinking, but it was like, we never, we hadn't seen each other for five years, but it was like, we're never thinking, and it's like, that's what you, you want. You don't lose your connection. Yeah. It's like, you never Because when you apart. lose that thing, you can kind of, suss up when you get that, it's a kinetic energy, when you meet someone who, but like, same when I met you guys, I sat down next to you and I'm thinking, I've done any of you guys. And you start jiving us, giving us some <laughs> of crap. Of course I do. So like, I was like, oh, well, I'm a fucking, I'm the master jive, eh? So if I jive him back, I can break in this crew easy because these are jives, I'm a jive, so we're all jiving. And then we just, everybody got along, you know what I mean? 
and there's no animosity, there's no arrogance, there's no ego. We're all trying to and help I think each that's other. What, that's what it is, and it's like, I think that's what I think that's what the community loves. It loves that kind of like, especially horror and sea, because I've never felt like anything like that. That kind of like passion. Yeah. As yeah, yeah. soon as you walk in that room, you feel that energy. There's like a, a force, mm. and if you don't go on with it, then back off. But if you want to feel that, it's the best buzz you could have. Yeah. It's exactly. like a drug. Like that second week when I was there, it was like I, I couldn't remember the week being home. I remember being there. I was the, like, the I two weeks kind of merged into yeah, one. Yeah, like, two wow. weekends merged into one. And um, one thing I want to talk about is yeah. one of your biggest inspirations, or yeah. uh, not so much an inspiration, but one of your biggest projects. You spent a lot of time working on this. We spoke about it quite candidly. Yeah. Ruby Rain. <clears throat> yeah. Talk about that. Well, Ruby Rain's more of like, uh, I wouldn't say. Passion, well, in a sense, it is a passion project. In the sense that, like, it's something that I couldn't do without like, a budget, so it's obviously something that we need a budget. But originally, it was just like it stems from the Diogena movie Trauma at the end. I uh, know you've seen it. So like, it was kind of like, you know, the very end where the camera you see the girl dancing. It's like Jamaican music. Well, if you watch it at the end, suddenly it goes to get like a, a gentle, bright color comes on. She starts dancing, and then a ruby rain track comes on. Now I hated the film. And it was, I was about to turn off and put the next one on because my friends were over and then as soon as I heard them, them notes, Ruby Rain, I was like, wow, it sounds so fucking beautiful. What is a Ruby Rain? And I thought, and I just had the image because of the film being in jail, I just had that image of that silhouette with a trilby hat and that kind of like that stance. I was like, wow. So then I thought, right, what would he be? Would it be a jail or killer? Like killer within a film that they give Ruby Rain or would he be a spree killer? And so I went to the spree killer angle. Wrote a script in 2007, it was 240 pages, but I felt it was more concentrated too much on the other characters rather than him. Mm -hmm. Then it wasn't until, until like the early noughties, or like probably like 2008, I seen Angst, the German film, 83, and that just totally changed my concept because I realised you can follow a killer. Things like Natural Born Killers and Badlands do follow killers, but yeah. the Natural Born Killers are more like a satire, more of a crazy take on yeah. following killers, and seeing Badlands more of a serious take, a dark take on it. When with this, it's more following one guy who's like kind of like chosen his path, but then realizes he faces the consequences, and then it's doing all the research. So it took like years, but the most hardest thing was casting Ruby, because throughout the first few years of developing the ideas, I shot loads of set pieces where it'd be me, Chris, or Ken, or somebody else playing Ruby, because I never wanted to show Ruby's face till I was comfortable showing Ruby's face. Yeah, so had to be I, the right one person. Actor, Jimmy Brown, who. I'd seen in so many players over the course of like them 10 years, I always thought, like, could he do it? So I watched him doing dramas, thrillers, comedies, and it was again the pantomime when I seen his time and how he reacted. And I was like, that's the person I need because comedy and horror are the closest things to Kevin genre. I thought if he can get time right and he understands the concept of how a horror gag works, to how a reaction works, then he'd be perfect and sent him a script and he loved it. So that first like 18 minutes that the short is, is kind of like the first 18 minutes of the movie, minus the voiceover at the end, because that's only there for the short. Yeah, so yeah. So it's like a tie into the, the short rather than thinking, because obviously the movie will just continue from there. So the hope for that is if that somebody wanted or somebody had that wanted to put, finance the bigger version, obviously it's more expansive into that world, because where does it go from there? If you want to do a plug, do a plug. Yeah, um, anybody wants to put any money into Ruby Rain, it's. Um, be nice to, uh, thing yeah um, it's a great short yeah thank you, thank you. <laughs> no, i appreciate that so <clears throat> yes it is it is a great short no uh, no i really appreciate that, that good. <laughs> i want to talk about klaus yeah klaus so tell us how a bit much about time we've got <sighs> well you've got a bit of time no that's good cool. now well um klaus was a different story because originally um thomas had the costume and like i just says can i borrow the costume just do a typical couple of students in a college, getting hunting it, get killed off. That was that was the plan. That's always the plan. You have you a couple of days with your students, then four days turns to four weeks, four months, and then you get you get forty percent of the film done, and you're thinking cool, and you get an actor back, and you're thinking right. So you get ninety percent of the film done, and that one actor just disappears. So you're left with the film that's got no ending, no resolution, no main actor. So I was stuck with this forty minute film. I hate leaving stuff. It feels like a debt. To a creation, yeah, yeah. you feel like you've left characters that you created just limbo. Like I said, right, I'll leave you unfinished. So I always go back and finish stuff. And Klaus was the next in my chopping block. Like that one for that was Last Zombie Hunter, where I just had 15 minutes in the middle of it, and that sort of that. But Klaus was like, right, I've got 45 minutes of a film, 
I'll add another 20 minutes and that'll make an hour that means a feature. Mm. So I tried different methods of having someone as a, explain it as a flashback with the students in the college. Didn't work. So I thought, right, I'll rewrite it. So I thought, right, I've got, there's a summer coming. It's, it, the summer's the best time for filming, really, isn't it? Yeah. You know what I mean? For time, having light and summer, sunlight. So I wrote a script in three days, just campers, all that stuff. Campers, one guy tells him about the ape and the ape's on loose, hunts him down. Day before filming, cast the actors, and there was only one actors out of all the campers I knew. The others were just like people I just emailed, said, do you want to do this? And I said, yeah, seems like a good idea, we'll just do it. Dropped us in the day before film, so I was like, shit. So what I'd done was, I thought, right, I'll film the scenes without them, and then go back. So I rewrote it, because originally it was a male, I rewrote it for a girl. So I rewrote it again. <laughs> Got to that point again, the ape backed out. Oh. So I was like, right, so again. So I was like, this is bad. But then I realised the missing point was, there was a guy who was in the original version that was shot six years ago in the college that you don't really see his death. So I thought, right, if I bring him back, it connects four versions. And then after it was like 20 minutes, I thought, that's brilliant. So I saw a right roll at the script again. And then I thought, now what? Why not have a mercenary? Hiring another bunch of mercenaries. And I'll put the, I'll leave the, car, the female in. And then I, before I knew it, I just, didn't make any fucking sense because I had so many subplots, so many loose ends. I had mercenaries, and I had ninjas, and I had mystic <laughs> shit. Now, before I knew it, I was like, this is just not making sense to me at all. <laughs> Wild. And, like, it, it, and the one of the biggest influences throughout any kind of film is the Goffy Ho, Thomas Tang, Joseph Lai ninja films, where it's cut and pierced, where it's like one film that that's got nothing to do with ninjas in a cut with a plot with ninjas. So I use that format. So if you watch the film, at some point, you know, like, one character is saying, we've got to run, Klaus is going to kill everybody. And then the next scene, she's like, oh, yeah, do you know there's mercenaries in the force chasing us? And it's like, Elna's saying, would you not mention the mercenaries when Klaus is like the good guy, you know what I mean? But it's just anyone who picks up on that, so I've kind of blew it up there. But, but that's the thing, it's like, it, it was just a hodgepodge, it was just a mess. So I kept showing up people saying, what can I do? And I, I don't know, just, it doesn't, I was like, shit, shit. So then I thought, because I had so many cars and people saying, what's it about? I'm like, I cannot say because. Yeah, it's about killing it, but it's not just about that. It's got layers. It's got so many different different avenues that can I go down. Different points within your life as well yeah. give you a different perception yeah. of how you're going to portray it, that it, film. It, it, it follow the girl who gets sent in the wood, getting chased by the mercenaries who follow the train to ape, or it'd be from Klaus's point of view. It could be from the guy who hires the mercenaries' point of view. It could be from the people who hunt and searching for this rare plant's point of view. I uh, sense a spin-off. But I've got the sequel, Son of Klaus. Yeah, I mean the sequel's ready to go. So then, when I when I finished it, it was just the only thing I would do is run, just keep adding and taking away because that's all it was. I was keep adding things, thinking right, it needs a gore shot. So I got this guy from the BBC, Mark Dunbury, to do the effects for one day. He said, buy the props, thirty five quid, the most expensive day I've ever did, thirty five smackers on the mark, paid it. I lost spoil if you haven't seen it because it is you know the money shot is, you know what I mean when you see the money shot, Sam, when you see that cut. Yeah. Throw a cut, that's the money shot, I got a nasty throw a cut and that was like 35 quid but because I had a bit more left, I've done a cut more, back the head shots, push it so the effects go a bit more. So then I think, right, what else do I need? And I thought, well, I just put a voiceover, voiceovers, get, yeah, well, anything really, voiceovers when you think about it. You put a voiceover or something, it gives it exp exposition. So <coughs> I put that on the opening and then before I knew it, I fixed it and then it flows. Nice. It works. I swear what it says unless they're lying. No, it's a great film. <laughs> no, no, no. So, the final thing for me, really, Steve, is Sam, um, what does the future hold? What's the next plans? Um, what you got going on? The, the future, um, it's hard to see. I mean, it's optimistic. That's the main thing, yeah, I mean. Other than it. writing something with us. Yeah, no, no, that's, <laughs> the, that's the dream, guys, yeah, I mean. No, honestly, it's like, it, 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 I'm more of a collaborative person, yeah, I mean, I think it's like, I think there's no point being so like closed up in your mind that you can't think outside that box. Other people outside the box and they can bring all the things into it. You know what I mean? Like and spur for an idea, one person's bad idea and bring a good idea. So it's always good to have people to bounce off. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of like working on some of my own, like a kind of like a shadow theater type movie, but also with you guys wanting to develop something a bit more like dark, a bit more filmatic, cinematic, if you know what I mean, rather than doing something of my own way, you know what I mean? Um, obviously promote Ruby and try and get out more and Klaus but also try and like move on Klaus and try and hopefully try and find a way to make a sequel to it because I made a lot of mistakes in Klaus 
that I learned from, you know what I mean? And it was like kind of like... Um, you feel like with the second one, you could almost rectify everything. Yeah, I me, mean, I, I, I am proud of it. You know what I mean, I'm, I, when I look at it, I think, wow, no way, that was like all a hassle for that. It was worth it. Because yeah. it, it's all on screen for me, you know what I mean? It's not being me being egotistical. I think it's just that like, when I see it, I think, wow, that was actually got there in the end, you know what I mean? I mean, at one point, my hard drive had screwed up. So the hard drive was completely messed up. All the edited footage was stuffed. All the stuff was scrambled. I got sent away. It cost 240 quid to get it done. Like I sent it away. put a specialist place to get it all. The centre back was still corrupted. So I re-edited the whole fucking thing oh, again. We, we that. I yeah. swore again. I did swear. <laughs> yeah. I had done one swear there. That's not bad. Do you know what I mean? I did very well. I'd be mean, be proud. Um, You've sworn a couple of yeah, times. Did I? Did I? Did I? <laughs> no way. Shit. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> the shit's alright though, isn't it? I love picking them up. <laughs> we worded Steve beforehand, but he's done well. He's done well. No, I've done class like. On that note, can I just say, first and foremost, it's a pleasure to Hounds have you down in Portsmouth. Well. Yeah, Hounds of Justice. Um, Boom. Just <laughs> um, and yeah, do you know what? I really appreciate the fact that you've come on board today. Um, You've let us interview you, you've spoken to us. No, honestly, it's been a pleasure, man. It's been mad. Like, normally I'm nervous, but no, you've made us feel at ease. Like, you're a cool <laughs> guy, she is like the white but you don't, need, don't say that. <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> um, but yeah, moving forward and stuff, we would be honoured to be able to collaborative work with yourself. Oh, no, that'd be brilliant. That'd, that'd be class, like, that'd be the way forward, man. Yeah, you know I mean, everybody benefits at the end of the day, you know what I mean? There's no losing the game, everybody's going to benefit in every way. No, exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, um, other than that, guys. And I just want to say a huge thank you again for listening to Trash Arts Tick. Um, and please, wait up for the next episode. Episode 5 will be out next Sunday. And um, so far, we'll definitely be reviewing The Lighthouse. So look out for that one. Other than that, please give us a like. Give us a subscribe. And if you feel like there's any kind of film that you want us to review, or anything in general in terms of the arts... Um, in terms of film, please do comment and let us know. Other than that, I'd like to thank you guys once again. Trash Arts, take out. Bye. Bye.